you enjoying uh, your pizza and drink. I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, speaker tonight and also get started. Um, Bob uh, is uh, first of all, and foremost a good friend of the department. He's been helping with the UV department. And we're looking forward to more uh, uh, collaborations with, with you also. Um, Bob is uh, currently the president and CEO of the local company called um, SoftTrack Corporation. We have two employees uh, uh, from SoftTrack. Uh, actually, uh, you also graduated from UBCS and, and uh, she graduated also from UV, but uh, economics. So, welcome back. Um, and uh, SoftTrack uh, develops a, a clear view CRM, I guess it stands for Customer Relationship Management uh, Software. Uh, and it's a company that the software is mostly uh, to raise funds for a non-profit organization. Bob oversees the company's overall business strategy and a vision, in addition to responsibilities related to marketing and product development, which is expected as a president and CEO, you do a lot of that. And um, he has uh, spent more than 30 years in the technology industry with expertise in product management, marketing um, management, strategic planning, business development. Previously, Bob, uh, Bob worked at IBM, uh, where he served as a global brand leader to, uh, for IBM's global service division, focusing on the marketing strategy and worldwide marketing program development and, and uh, execution. Uh, Bob has a broad experience in uh, technology product marketing, marketing program development and deployment, channel marketing planning and marketing communication. Bob is a super con logger graduate from UBCS department back in what time? 79. 79. A few years ago. Most, right, some of you haven't even born that time yet, right, correct? Right. <laughs> The question is, were your parents born back then? So, uh, and, and Bob also received uh, his MBA uh, program from UB with a concentration on marketing. So, uh, welcome Bob and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, so, be honest with me, you know, this is all about, this lecture is all about honesty. Did you come here for the lecture or for the pizza? <laughs> come on. Pizza, raise your hand. All right. <laughs> well, welcome. So, you know, I want to I want to learn a little bit about you. So, who uh, is everybody here in computer science or computer engineering? Everybody raise your hand just so I can get some of that. Cool. Anybody here from anything else? Like history, English, anything? No? Okay. Good. How about who's who's uh, upperclassmen, junior, senior? Can you raise your hand? Okay. Lowerclassmen, freshmen. Great guys. I'm proud of you guys. You know, stepping out early. On. That's good. That's good. Great. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna talk about a little bit of the soft side of software development. So you guys have been learning about what I call the hard side, right? Uh, understanding programming, uh, computing concepts, theory, all that kind of stuff. But there's a soft side to it, so when you get into the uh, work environment, you know, you make choices about your career, and one of the choices may lead you down to a path where you're working with teams of people, building stuff. So, I'm curious, one of the reasons a lot of people get involved with computer science, computer engineering, is like to build stuff. Are you guys like to build stuff? Is that why you got involved in it? Who, raise your hand just so I can see it. Who likes to build stuff? Okay. Who's getting into it for the money? <laughs> okay, we got a couple. It's honest, that's good. There's money in it. Yeah, there's money in it now. Um, one of the things that you'll learn when you uh, get into your career is that you know all of the hard skills that you develop, they're really important to get your foot in the door, but to progress in your career, some of that soft skill development really needs to start early on in your career. And we're going to talk about um, a method we use, that's a great picture of playing this game. I'm going to talk about a method we use in software development that really brings together the development of soft skills and it's all about teamwork. 
you know, it's working very collaboratively as a team when you're doing software <coughs> development. You know, oftentimes you find yourself, you know, in academia working on a lot of individual projects. You know, you're, it's all about, you know, you're learning, you know, you're getting good grades in school. And the method that we use for software development, um, it's a little different. It's all about working with your team and helping your team win. Um, sometimes at the expense of your own personal advancement, right? And that's a very interesting concept, and it's, sometimes it's a hard one to realize. So let me uh, jump into a little bit about what SoftTrack's about, our company, and then talk about the software development method we use. It's called Agile, and these folks kind of represent people that are Agile, right? And this one in particular, if any of you guys turn 90 and can do that, my hat's off to you. That woman is doing things that I couldn't do 20 years ago. So SoftTrack Corporation, we're a software company. We develop nothing but software, and we support that software through uh, a variety of ways. But it was founded by a school, classmate of mine, a schoolmate of mine from uh, the University of Buffalo. We, he actually uh, started the company after he was working for me for a couple of years in another startup. I think he got tired of me. He wouldn't admit that. He got tired of me and decided to start his own company. And he did so. Um, we pride ourselves as an innovative software company. We have some really marquee clients in the fundraising space. Dana Farber Cancer, Cancer Institute, one of the largest cancer institutes in the country that uh, use our fundraising software. Catholic Relief Services, an international uh, relief organization. They, uh, they provide a lot of relief services uh, through the fundraising that they do. They're, they're a almost billion dollar organization. Metropolitan Museum of Art, Lincoln Center, Salvation Army, all very familiar names use our software. And uh, one interesting thing, we've been, you know, cloud, the terminology for cloud kind of just, I think, immersed over the last five years or so. The cloud model, kind of a hosted model of application, of, of distributed application, really about for us in 2002. So we've been really a cloud provider since 2002. At that time, it was called ASPs, Application Specific Programming, today, and then it turned into SaaS, and now it's cloud but we were delivering our software via cloud. But we're also a fun company to work for, you know, so we, we have a lot of fun developing innovative software, but we have a lot of fun, as you can see by the food that we eat, the scary people that come to our Halloween parties, the teddy bear that likes to join us at Halloween. Um, we have a lot of people that cook good food, and, um, you know, oftentimes we're, we have fun challenges, like uh, one of the challenges that software engineers undertook uh, this Christmas is, I pulled out, any of you guys ever have a race car track, ever played with a race car track? Lots of fun, right? So I had one that uh, I blew the dust off, it was probably 20 years old, brought it in, and gave the engineers about 20 minutes to put this track together and have these cars operational, and they did it. It was amazing, it was amazing to be. So we play that every morning to see who could win on a racetrack. So we, we have a fun company. Um, so the product we develop is called Clearview, it's fundraising software. Uh, on the technical side, it's Java, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. It's highly scalable, highly configurable platform, complex enterprise level application. So it's a big, big product. There's a lot of moving gears in it. And we've got an embedded intelligence, uh, business intelligence engine, a company called Tipco. So instead of developing our own business intelligence, we took an integration path, so we took this big chunk of business intelligence and predictive analytics and we built it into our software via an API. And we might talk a little bit about that, but we can certainly, after the uh, talk, give you more information about that because it's, it's pretty cool. So, developing software. So, you know, one of the traditional methods or ways people viewed building software is similar to building a house, right? It was kind of a very serial process at times. And the process was called waterfall, and I used it, you know, in my career since 1979 all the way up, up, up until about five years ago. Very traditional. And the traditional mechanism was you go through discovery, you design it, you develop it, you get customer acceptance, and you deliver it. So when you think about a big project, think about a project you get assigned to that it's going to take you two years to develop, right? 
somebody says, hey, you know, I want you guys to develop a fundraising application for enterprise nonprofit organizations. It has to have these features. So they give you a one-page list of features. And you've got a team of six people that can work with you. Have at it. So what's, think about that. Think about that. What's the first thing you want to kind of poke at? Like, okay, I got that mission, so how do I tackle that? Well, one way that was, it was tackled with Waterfall was they gave it to a bunch of business analysts. And these business analysts spent a lot of time talking to potential customers and said, hey, you know, give me your requirements. Tell me what you need. And I'm going to document that. I'm going to put that in a big document. And then, once I get, get documenting all of your needs, I'm going to hike it over to another group of guys and gals. And these are systems analysts, <coughs> architects, and designers. And we're going to have them do the technical design on it. We know kind of what we, we've got a document saying what you want. We're going to have these guys do the technical, technical design on it and produce a document. So they produce a document. And now they give it to the developers. So they give it to the software engineers and the testers. And they say, hey, go code this. You know, take this. Now you're probably, you know, nine months into the project trying to work off documents. And the engineers are feeling pretty good about it because they've got a document that says, hey, build it this way. Make it do these things. And you're starting to code. And you're making that happen. And you're getting it tested. And everything that that document said, you're able to build, right? You're feeling really good about it because the engineers, we're building stuff, right? We're doing the things we want to do. We're building stuff. Then it goes to acceptance. So now, you, once you're done building it, you tested it, you give it back to a team that's really close to the customer, and they do acceptance testing, saying, yeah, this kind of meets all the stuff. Lo and behold, here's where things break down, right? And here's where things start to go awry. And they go awry for a couple of reasons. As I said, the engineers are pretty happy with it. You know, they did their work. They, they did all their coding. They did all their testing. They gave it to the acceptance guys. And the customers said, hey, we're done. We did everything that these documents told us to do. And we, we might be even on time and on budget. You know, 11, two, one year and 11 months have passed. And you know, I'm, I'm under budget. I'm doing great. But then it goes to acceptance testing. And it gets deployed to the clients. And this is two years after they gave you requirements, right? So you got customers looking at this like this. And I've actually worked on projects with customers after we deliver the product look like this. <laughs> and this is a customer you don't want to be near. And why do you think that is? I mean, why do you think that is? Why would they be, you told them, they knew it was going to take you two years, right? They all signed up for that. You guys did, the engineering group did their job, the BAs did their job, the designers did their job, and the guys deploying it, now they're, now that it's hitting the fan, so to speak, with the class. Why do you think that happens? Well, one of the reasons it happens, one of the most important reasons, is related to this quote, walking on water and developing software from a specification are both very, very easy if both were frozen. Right? Think about that. Over two years, do you think, do you think maybe the customers, those business analysts spoke two years ago, they might have changed their minds on their requirements? Think about that. Two years have passed. Might they have changed their minds? May have technology changed in two years? Where they thought that they wanted perhaps an application to work one way, now they're seeing other applications in the marketplace, maybe even using them, and saying, well, I wanted our application to work that way. So a lot of things that have changed, right? Nothing was frozen in time except that document, that spec document, right? From two years ago. And that's a problem. There's problems for clients in the waterfall process, so we're following this very serial process, right? Respect to deployment. There's problems for clients. When we saw some of the faces, they're dissatisfied. There's problems for engineers doing the development team. And you know, although the engineers are happy during that process, at the end of the process, when the when you hand that product over to the client and the client absolutely hates it, how are you going to feel as an engineer? You don't feel good, you know. 
You're proud that you built this thing. You want to show everybody. It's like, take a look at this. We had it built to your spot. And all of a sudden, they look at me and go, oh my God, it's, what the hell did you build? And they go, well, I built this to your spec. Well, yeah, but I didn't mean that. How did you do that? So all of a sudden, you as an engineer have spent all your time and energy building this product. You've got nobody that wants to use it. You know, and that's not fun. It's not why we build things, is it? So there's a couple <coughs> problems with the waterfall. These two cartoons, I think, illustrate some of the problems. And these guys are going to play the roles of the people in the Dilbert cartoon. I'm the triangular. Oh, oh here, me. take a mic real quick. Because this, <laughs> this is a great cartoon. And I'll need to know your requirements before I start to design the software. First of all, what are you trying to accomplish? I'm trying to make you design my software. <laughs> I mean, what are you trying to accomplish with the software? I won't know what to, I can I won't know what I can accomplish until you tell me what the software can do. Try to get this concept through your thick skull. <laughs> the software can do whatever I design it to do. Can you design it to tell you my requirements? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so that, that's a classic, right? I mean, that, that happens. Um, this, is a, this, is, you, you know, this is a cartoon from some of the textbooks when I went to school way back. And I don't know if they're uh, still there, but this is fundamentally what happens, right, in Waterfall. In Waterfall, well, not just in Waterfall, in reality, software development, you know, customer explains it a certain way. They want to, you know, your BA is interpreting that, saying, okay, yep, you want to spring with three layers to it, great. Uh, project leader, now, now you're handing that off and describing that to a project leader, and his view on it is a spring, a spring that looks like this, and then it goes to the analyst, and they design it to look like this. It goes to the programmer and it wrote the program like this. That's got sad, right? Programming like that. <laughs> then it goes to the business consultant. That's how they describe it. How the project was documented <laughs> typically happens, right? No documentation, missing in action. What the operations installed, they put a rope up, no swing. How the customer was built, we overbuilt them, we built a roller coaster. How it was supported, there was absolutely no support. And this is actually what the customer really needed. So, you know, the point here is, one of the salient points is, it's really difficult, it's really difficult to have a customer tell you what they need. They tell you what they want. Sometimes, and oftentimes, they tell you what they want in a solution statement, not what their need is, you know, not what problem they're trying to solve. They basically describe that problem as a, as a, as a solution to you. Like, hey, I need this to do this. Well. Okay, you need that to be blue, and you need that button to be green down there. Why? You know, a lot of the work that our business analysts do, they, they, they sound like a parrot. They say why a lot. You know, we, we have this kind of theory, like, you got to say why five times before you can get down to the real need, right? So when you're in a waterfall method, it's really difficult not only to get the customers to describe what they need, but you've got a lot of handoffs going on, a lot of room for interpretation between those handoffs, and that really creates the majority of problems with the waterfall. So there's got to be a better way, right? So somebody, you know, great software developer said, you know, there's other approaches we can take to this. There's other methodologies we can use instead of waterfall. So they called in the inventors, and they developed this agile manifesto. In 2001, they said individuals and interactions are more important than process and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. So Build working software, don't just document stuff. Build working software. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Talk to your customers a lot. Get them involved in the software development process. Don't talk to them, go away for two years and deliver something to them. That's, that won't work. And then responding to change instead of following the plan. So recognizing when you develop software, it is not like building a house. Things are, there's a lot of moving gears in software development. There's a lot of room for misunderstanding in software development. Uh, You've got to continue to communicate and collaborate with one another. So this agile method of software development developed. And it's a philosophy and a methodology. It's about teamwork. You know, it gets to this motive of the team. 
I think this is kind of cute, so I just display this. It's got something to do with teamwork, but it's, I love that penguin. He's a guy to keep the eye on. <laughs> Teamwork. <laughs> they all work together. <laughs> Save each other's lives. Unless <laughs> someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Dr. Seuss, right? Agile practice is focusing on giving teams and individuals ownership of their work and accountability to the team and organization so that you care to make things better, right? You care to make, so think about working in a team environment where you all care as much about you're producing something a client actually wants. And you're following a methodology that allows you to do that. So, there's a number of agile uh, software development methodologies. We use one called Scrum. Um, there's Lean, there's uh, EX, there's Unified. Uh, we use Scrum. Scrum has worked for us, mainly because some of the guys that work at SoftTrack look like these Scrum guys, <laughs> and they were Scrum teachers. No, I'm just kidding about that. Another great quote, you know, great things in business are never done by one person. They're done by a team of people, Steve. You know, he, uh, he's done many great things and he's a true believer in teamwork and has done a great job in putting some fantastic teams together in Apple. So a traditional Scrum team framework, it consists of, the Scrum team consists of a number of players in it, okay? So in the Upper side here, there's stakeholders. Stakeholders could be customers. They could be an internal project sponsor that wants an internal application built. Then you've got a business owner, and this is the person kind of doing all the translating and stuff. Like, okay, tell me what you need. I'll kind of communicate to this team, and we'll get things going and get things built. Um, we've got a scrum master, a product owner, and some engineering folks. So the product owner, what does he do? Product owner is the person that has the vision and goals for the product, re represents the customers and users and manages a backlog, and we'll talk about a backlog in a minute. But fundamentally, the product owner is the one that takes ultimate responsibility of the product. If a client does not like the product, it's really the product owner's problem. He's got to solve that. It isn't an engineering problem, it isn't a business analyst problem, it's a product owner problem. So the product owner is, you know, he's really driven and motivated to really talk to the client quite a bit. He's the person that may bring in business analysts to drill down on their needs, to talk about what they really need, not what they think they need, um, and he owns that. So he creates you know, the long-term and short-term vision for the product. Like, this is what this thing is going to do next year, two years from now, five years from now. These are all the features I want to put in it, so on and so forth. So he's responsible for guiding that whole vision. The Scrum Master, what do they do? They're planning the sprints. In this language, we'll get into a minute, we'll explain what sprints are. Prioritizing the sprint backlog, they play the role of the team leader, manages the development process. So they manage the process. They're the, you know, think about a project manager, you know, somebody that has a team, doesn't report to that team, doesn't <coughs> report to them, they're reporting to other areas in the organization, but they're managing that project, and of all the people working on that project, they make sure they're doing their work on that project so it gets done the way it should. Another group of the Scrum team is the BAs, it's the engineers, it's the testers, and they're responsible for prioritizing the sprint backlog, estimating the efforts. You know, we'll talk about estimation. How do you know, you know how much work you can get done in, in this amount of time? Uh, they develop and achieve sprint goals. They implement test cases. They're writing unit and initial acceptance testing. So the Scrum team does a lot of things. So, our Scrum teams look like this. So we have um, a product owner. I play that role sometimes for one of our products. I'm very intimately involved with our clients and with the Scrum team. So I play the product owner role. I'm the guy that they look to to give a vision to the product. Say, hey, this is what I wanted to do this year. This is what I wanted to do next year. Let's put these feature sets in. Let's not put these feature sets in. I kind of make all those, those decisions. Got a business analyst, and that business analyst, uh, particularly one of the senior analysts, they work as almost a proxy product owner 
very closely with me about requirements. You know, what are the needs that we have to address in the product? We have a UI and UX designer on our team. So, you know, one of the things that's really important for our product, it has, the user experience has to be exceptional. You know, we're competing in a very uh, competitive environment. There's a lot of products that do the same things that we do functionally. One of our differentiators is the look and feel and the experience we provided with our product. So we're really, really spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, we have a documentation specialist. They're on our team. So they're writing documentation on the product. So we've got to make sure that our users have all the education tools that they need to use our product effectively. So we've got the documentation specialist, software engineers, a lot of software engineers on the team. And in the middle of that is the master, the scrum master. By the way, Amy is our scrum master. Um, she, uh, she is the boss of the, uh, of the team. And Dean is one of our software engineers on the scrum team. Dean, maybe you can talk a little bit about what else you do. Sure. Uh, one of the things I do is what's called Hero. So once a week, or once a week, one of the software engineers become known as the hero. And by the way, I have a cape. <laughs> He's well, got a red cape, he does. Yeah. Uh, we pass around so, so, uh, so people know who the hero is that week. So we have, at our company, we have uh, client support, and they answer questions about uh, our, our software. So if, they have, if a customer has some questions or they don't quite understand something, or they notice a bug, generally the customer support takes care of it. However, sometimes the customer support notices weird behavior, some oddity, or some weird corner case uh, that they experience that shouldn't be there, so they send it to us. So one of my duties is to analyze that, make sure it is a bug, document that, track it, fix it, and then put it out for release. And if it's something complicated, we will put it in our backlog and story point it later and deal with it at a later time. Great, thanks. One thing you'll find out when you start working in, in the field with other software engineers, they don't like the word bug, right? So when you have somebody a piece of code and you know they uh, they hand it back to you and they say it's buggy or you know it's, things broke, it doesn't work, you know. Mostly on the software engineering side, we call that it's just unfinished work. They, uh, the, the clients, however, they don't call it that. They call, they call it a, a bug. Um, this, is a, this is a process. So we're talking about teamwork and process. So this is a process. This gives you an idea of what the framework looks like for, uh, for Scrum. So we get a product owner gets a lot of inputs on you know, what features should be in the product, what things need to be fixed. Um, imagine you've got an enterprise level product. You've got hundreds, thousands of users of that product, and everybody wants to give their input on what should be happening with that product, right? You gotta manage that. Um, so the product owners gotta manage it. So I get all those requests, right? I get you know, hundreds of them a month. Like, okay, I wanna do this. What about adding this feature? What about changing this? You know, all that kind of stuff goes on. So we collect that in what's called the product backlog. We have a meeting as a team, and we begin to sort through some of that stuff and say, okay, what's important, what's not important, what, what can we work on, what can we not work on. We work in, it says in sprint one to four, we, we work in two week sprints. That means we all agree to a piece of work that we can get done in two weeks so that we can push all of that work into production, right? So what we do is every two weeks we agree uh, in a sprint planning meeting on the issues, we'll call them issues, on the work that we can get done in those two weeks. As a team, we commit to do that, and at the end of those two weeks, we deliver that new code, we push that out into production. So, again, it's a, it's a very interesting process because you, you're push, pushing it out into a production environment that hundreds, thousands of people are using this application, right? So you gotta be pretty darn sure that everything you just changed in that code base is working well, right? So you gotta, there's a number of things we do, and me and I'll tell you a little bit about those as we move forward. Uh, but that gets, that's, that's kind of the challenging side of it. Well, we do our sprint planning, so we figure out what we can do in two weeks. Um, the engineering team then takes these issues and they, they do task breakdown on them. And they basically say, okay, these are all the tasks, the engineering tasks that need to happen. 
And it's all self-directed, so there's a bunch of work, right? They're all listed, and we'll show you a little example of that in a minute. They're all listed out, and here are all the work we have to do. And the engineers basically, they self-direct. They pick what they want to work on. You know, nothing's assigned to them. It's all self-assigned work, which is kind of cool. So you can pick what you want. Sometimes there's negotiations about that. I don't know if you guys arm wrestle a lot, but <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, after the, after the two weeks, so by the way, during the two weeks, we have these daily scrum meetings. And we'll talk about those in a minute, how those go. Uh, and at the end of the two weeks, we've got, we do a sprint review, we've got finished work, and we're deploying software. And Amy's going to talk to you a little bit about our process, because it's a little different than this. Great. So in terms of a, the product backlog and requests coming in, we've had our product out for quite a while. And we've taken a lot of requests from clients, but we also take in requests from our own uh, internal staff. Some of those people include our trainers, our client support people, uh, people who talk to a lot of clients and then get a lot of feedback from them. It's really great to filter it through um, this first backlog that we have to kind of group things together in a way that makes sense, try to find common threads and make sure that we're not duplicating efforts or you know, complicating things for things that we want to do later on. Um, so we have a lot of our, our business analysts that work through those requests. A lot of times we have to go back to our clients or different staff members for more information. So there's a lot of different cycles. Like you'll notice a lot of cycles that happen here. <laughs> um, so then eventually, in order to get anything done, we have to take these big requests and these big ideas and break them down into tasks that we can actually ask these guys to accomplish in a two week period. And sometimes that's a really huge challenge. Um, but something that if you get a lot of really great people <coughs> into the same room from a bunch of different departments, you can accomplish it in a rather short amount of time relative to, say, a situation where you don't have a lot of process. So that's why we have everything really laid out as to who's responsible for what and um, what everybody has to do. So. So by the time it makes it to the engineers, we're talking about technical task breakdowns and everything. There's some meetings. So I'm mentioning a lot of meetings. Who here loves meetings? Anybody? <laughs> okay, who here loves to get interrupted multiple times per day while they're in the zone trying to work? Even fewer people, I would guess. So a lot of what I do as a Scrum Master is schedule meetings and try to make sure that we stay on task and we accomplish whatever goals that we need to do. So if that's deciding to prioritize things in the backlog and queue them up for um, going on to the engineers to get task breakdown, then that's what we do. And eventually what happens in the sprint planning meetings is we all get together. Um, so this includes the engineers, uh, the UX designer, um, also our documentation specialists, and our business analysts, and we all sit in a room, and part of the planning is for accountability, so that we can all agree, as Bob mentioned, of what we're going to accomplish in the next two week period. And that helps us set expectations for our clients and for people internally to figure out, you know, when can we expect um, some of this functionality to come out? How can we queue up our documentation, prepare people to be able to test everything? So, that's something that happens in sprint planning, and then we also do some story pointing. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that part. I think maybe I'm skipping ahead here. No, but that's but okay because we're gonna yeah yeah we want to lose some time for Q and A. Right. I think yeah. Why don't you talk a little bit about the story pointing and task breakdown process? Sure. So as Amy said, we have issue tasks, and they're broken down into very compartmentalized issues, so that it's not overreaching in terms of scope and complexity. Uh, each task, though, we give it uh, what's called a story point. They're fairly arbitrary, but they determine how difficult the issue is. Uh, I forgot my deck of cards, but it, imagine like a Fibonacci sequence of 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 20, in terms of like, so, you know, between, you know, 1 is like a typo, and then 20 is <laughs> something that's really difficult that takes, going to take like a week or two to finish. So we, as a team, as an engineer team, we all draw cards and then we <coughs> see what the average is and kind of come to consensus. Sometimes someone draws low, someone, sometimes someone draws high, 
they generally explain why they draw that way, and then we agree upon a number. And what happens in the sprint is that generally we have about, a, let's say, a total of like 60. And that's how many story points we generally finish in a sprint. So based upon how many, it doesn't matter how many numbers of tasks there are, it's just a matter of how hard those are. So we generally agree to finish around 60 a sprint, and we know that if we go over, then it's probably we're not going to finish that. Yeah, and, yeah, Amy did. It's really kind of upset. <laughs> yeah, one of the things Amy does is, you know, during our, um, and let me, let me show you, illustrate for you one of the tools we use. Yeah, you can see this. So um, we, we use a product uh, to help us manage uh, our issues, you know, the things we want to accomplish and our backlog and all that kind of stuff. Uh, years ago when we started using Agile, it was all on post-it notes, you know. We would basically have a pile of post-it notes, stick them on a wall and move them around. Now there's some technology that someone developed that we can use. So each one of these line items represents a piece of work that has to get done. This is this current sprint called Hulk. And these are all of the issues that we're working on in Hulk. Um, these are the story points, 13 for this one, 5 for that one, so on and so forth. Um, and that totals up to, let's see, 42, 42 story points for this sprint. So what we do every day, we talk about daily uh, stand-ups. So every day we're looking at this. You know, we get in a, we get in a room in the morning. Uh, Amy coordinates that, so the whole sprint team gets in the room. Um, go, go around person by person to report on your status. What work you got done yesterday, what work you're getting done today, and whether or not you have any blocks, meaning you can't get work done because somebody needs to get something done for you. There might be some dependency you have on somebody else's work, so on and so forth. We do that every day. So we've got a pretty clear idea every day how we're progressing in our sprint. Because remember, what happens with this, this is really important. What, what happens with Sprints and Scrum is that the team commits to get the work done in two weeks. They decide what work gets done in two weeks. No one's pushing that on them. The team decides. I'm not coming in, though I would like to sometimes. I'm not coming in saying, hey, I need you to do you know, 50 issues instead of 30 issues. You guys decide. You guys decide. But you have to commit, meaning it has to get done. You may, not, you may run into problems with it. There might be some long nights because you didn't expect something. You story pointed something wrong. You get better at story pointing, but you're committing to get it done. So given the fact you're committing to get it done, Amy's job is to make sure that as we're progressing through the sprint, that we've got a good velocity going in getting that work done by the end of the two-week period. And if, we, if we're not, we have conversations about it. Sometimes we have to make midstream adjustments to say, okay, that piece is much more complicated. Maybe we have to take a shortcut with it. We can't put all the feature sets in it. We've got to cut a feature out. Let's do that. But that's all done collectively. That's not done individually. That's done collectively. The, uh, the backlog, by the way, so this is a sprint. So you know, one of the jobs of PO that I do is I build these sprints out. So I, you know, I look into the future and I say, OK, this was this, this is this two-week sprint. Then I'm building out the next two-week sprints. Then I'm starting to build out six weeks out. Then I've got this big backlog of stuff. We have probably over 450 issues that have come in over the last four years, right? All of these issues come in. I review them. I review them with the VAs. We do some analysis on them. We prioritize and we use certain methods to prioritize. Business need, complexity, uh, usage by all clients, all that kind of stuff. We use a, what's called the Moscow method uh, to prioritize it. And the things that we prioritize high go in this backlog. The other stuff is kind of in a called the bushel. It's in the bushel. It may get to the backlog sometime, but it's not in our development backlog yet. This is what our backlog looks like. So what I'm doing, you know, uh, as well as the proxy VA, uh, proxy product owners, uh, they do it more than I do, they're moving this stuff up. They're getting new stuff in the backlog. They're making decisions on priorities, and they're building out these sprints. So it's a pretty, this tool that we use is a pretty effective tool to help us manage that whole process. We've got lots of issues, hundreds of issues coming in. You've got to prioritize them so they can get the work done and provide the most value for your clients within a two-week period. You've got to put some thought to it. Process is really important. You know, it isn't just about coding anymore. It's more about process. I think, let me do this. Yeah, we showed you a little bit about the whole flow here. So 
I'm going to kind of skate through this real quick. Um, Spur planning meeting, we talked about that. Daily standards, I just talked about that. Um, yeah, maybe you guys can spend a minute talking about the spread reviews meeting, because that's really important. So at the end of the two weeks, when everybody's done with their work, we have a review meeting. Amy, you know, accurately schedules those after, after, <laughs> after 10 business days to uh, have it's that meeting. It's kind of meeting. the deadline. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the deadline, so to speak. Um, or maybe you can talk to what happens at those meetings. Right, so the sprint review part um, is generally a larger group. So we'll have the product owner, the business analyst, um, our documentation specialist, uh, and then some, some other people uh, also get engaged depending on um, whose client the features are for, things like that. Um, and then also some of the other engineers that we have working with us um, that work in the database end. So what we do is we go through, and we'll generally have a developer uh, show, as either speak to you if it's not showable, or show any features um, that the product owner has asked them to complete during the course of the sprint. And so that's a chance for uh, the rest of the people in the meeting to look at what's been accomplished, and you know congratulate the engineers about it, sometimes give some feedback on the spot, um, and then all of this is to eventually queue it up to get a release internally uh, for our documentation specialists, our trainers, and a number of people internally to be able to kick the release around a bit, you know, give some uh, first chance at doing some internal testing. These guys have their functional tests and a lot of the more technical end of it that they write and run everything through before it even gets to this meeting. Um, but sometimes it's good to just have a human pair of eyes on there. So this is the meeting where we go through and demonstrate what we've done. Um, and then, you know, everybody gets to decide whether we accomplish the thing that we set out to do um, in, the, in the sprint. So then uh, the developers and the scrum team hang around for the retro, and generally other people leave. And this is kind of, I like to look at this part as more of a lessons learned kind of Space. So we have this great process, um, but you know it's it's a process and it's sturdy and it's meant to keep people accountable and keep order. Uh, but it's also something that we allow to grow and change depending on the feedback that we get from our own team members. So we want to be able to uh, acknowledge that any issues that came up and be able to not just be immediately reactive in the short term, but to really invest in creating a better process that assesses that and addresses it uh, for the long term. So maybe you can talk about your experience in the review and retro? Sure. So for the review and retrospective, for software engineers, it's nice to kind of reflect back on what you did for the week. Because sometimes, her first half of the week, you did something like completely complicated. And then you, after you're done, you know, write your functional tests and your unit tests kind of blocked out of your mind and then you work on something else. And it's nice to be able to go back and look at it as a whole and see what you learn and express some of that to the rest of the team in order for them to sometimes learn from it, sometimes you know, sh show basically what you've done and accomplished. And we've learned a lot of random things throughout. For example, if one would release a big, big product, that we should probably have like a lighter sprint afterwards because a lot of issues do come up they're kind of random. Mental anguish. Uh, kind of un unfinished work, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So stuff like that that disturbs us throughout the week, and like it, it, it makes it so that we don't necessarily be, are able to finish our process. Other times, it's just learning that sometimes an issue that we thought was easy was way harder than we thought, so we can restore it for the better. But overall, it's a way for us to learn and you know constantly improve our process so that we can fine tune it and be more like a well-oiled machine. Thanks, guys. Yeah, from a product owner perspective, you know, I, I always look forward to the retro spats uh, for, for a number of reasons. One is, you know, the, the team is very, very good about providing, you know, candid, honest uh, feedback to each other. You know, they, it's, it's, I don't, you don't see it often enough where, as a team, you can really have some good, open conversation with others, we'll be focused on doing better the next time. And so, you know, it's all about that continuous improvement process. And um, 
Grub really pushes you to that, you know. And you know, I, I love this, you know, continuous improvement. I'm sure it'll change tomorrow. And that's what's that's what that's what Agile is all about, you know, recognizing that stuff changes while you're developing it, and you've got to be flexible to deal with the change. You accept that. And the best thing you can do is you know work on small chunks of stuff, get it out quick, you know, early delivery, right? Quick development, early delivery, get it out. Get those features out as quick as you can. Get get in customers' hands and get feedback on them. Michael Jordan, ta talent wins games, right? Individual talent wins games. So teamwork and intelligence wins, wins championships, and that's what I think Scrum's all about. So that's that's what we do. I mean, that's the process that we, that's a methodology we've been using for the last four years or so. It's working out really well for us. We've got a happy set of clients. The product's doing really great. Uh, you know, we've uh, one thing that we've learned about uh, Scrum and Agile is that you know there isn't a cookie cutter approach methodology you use. You know, you've got to based on your business needs and business goals, you've got to kind of create some derivatives of it. So ours is in traditional, what I'll call traditional cookie cutter Scrum. We've kind of fine tuned it on some nuances of our business, um, but it's a great way to work. And as I said at the beginning, <coughs> you guys are learning all your hard skills right now. Being on a working in an agile environment will help develop soft skills. And you know, if you at any point in time you start looking for um, employment uh, and develop and growing in your career, you know, if you can find a company that is do, doing agile sort of waterfall, I think you'll really enjoy it a lot better than some of the old methodologies that have been used in the past. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. They can be technical questions too because we have a great engineer here. I, I have one. Yeah. If you, if you let the uh, sort of the team to decide how long it's going to take for them to, uh, you know, say finish the job, is there another entity which will kind of like evaluate whether or not that is reasonable? Or I mean, how do you then prevent? I guess if you have they're a highly motivated the employee, then yes, but. How do you prevent you know, people to say, well, this job really you know, takes a week, but they say it's going to take us two months? Yeah, that, that, we, we call it sandbagging. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sandbagging it. Um, yeah, the, the, the controlling factors are the team just isn't the engineers. The engineers are the ones that are kind of doing the story pointing, but the team has a product owner, it has business analysts. So we're kind of there as, you know, we all work together, and, you know, and, and me and, you know, he can respond to this, but, you know, I think they're self-motivated, but by the same token, there are other influencers that kind of make sure that we can push. I'm probably always the one where they're story pointing 20s. I'm going, that looks like a one to me. Come on, are you kidding me? Or, you know, they'll say, hey, our velocity, you know, we can get down to 60 points. I'm going, oh, you can do 70 or 80, you know, so I'm playing that role, you know, as a controller. But, you know, these guys are pretty self-motivated. Right. Uh, so some of the issues that we've had, they're very similar to issues we've had in the past. So we can generally use it as a guideline too. So we've done like something similar. We'll say uh, it's about the same story of playing. Uh, if it is something really big, like let's say 20, then for the most part, we should that should be something we should be able to break down into smaller chunks. So you generally won't have something like 20 or 40. And if it is, then we might have to take another stab at it. And generally when we do have issues that big, there's gonna be a lot of discussion. You'll see so much discussion about how is architecture, why is this way, um, there's documentation and process to kind of ensure that you'll see what you see. So, yeah, generally it just, it, you just won't see it that way. Um, plus, we like doing more work. Like, that's what keeps us interested in software engineers. We like doing more and different things. So, if we're just doing one issue that's technical, you know, three, but we say it's a point, we'll get bored and then we'll have to do with something else, anyways. So. I just want to add too, for the client committed items that we have, we go through a pretty extensive planning process that usually starts with estimation. So the time that we estimate isn't necessarily matched up with the story points that they put on, but in general, it really helps to kind of get ahead of things. And so that's what we've been doing over the course of the past few months. Um, a lot of the people responsible for planning and, and doing the client committed items um, are able to factor that in when talking to the product owner and the business analyst to let them know that, you know, hey, we're going to have to get ahead of this and start it. Um, so we estimated about these many hours for it, and we'll see what
what comes out with the story points. It could be, you know, something that isn't quite on point there, but, you know, staying ahead of it and everything really helps to uh, help them accomplish things and set them up for success because there's so many other, um, so many other points that products have to pass through, like the business analysts and everything. They have to go through the, the whole process and get to the engineers in such a way where they can finish the job and the time that they need to, so. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it's accountability and personal drive. So it's generally self-monitoring, but there's a lot of other influencers in the process. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to mention too about the software on the software engineering side, which is kind of cool, is that you know innovation. You know, you're not just kind of in a production environment just cracking out code all the time. You know, we're trying to think about doing new and different things. Uh, both at a micro level and a macro level. So at the micro level, you know, we may want to use a different, you know, um, JavaScript tool set, for example. So within a sprint, we'll build what's called a spike, and we'll say, hey, there's a spike. It doesn't count as story point, but we're going to put a time box around it to say an engineer can spend, you know, two days working with this new library to see if it will provide any value for our application. So that that work is assigned to that engineer, and he will work with that library and come back and report to the team to say, hey, I think this library is great. We ought to think about switching it out. I've done some analysis. Here are the points we can switch out. So there's a lot of, you know, at the, the, the micro level, there's a lot of innovation still going on using kind of spikes as ways to, you know, take some time and do some different things, do some work with some innovation that you wouldn't ordinarily do just kind of cranking out production. Questions? Uh, what happens, you know, worst case scenario when something or a task on your sprint list doesn't get done? Is there a process to find that, you know, worst case scenario something comes up and it just doesn't <laughs> roll over? You gotta deal with Amy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much the, <laughs> pretty much the, the consequence. Yeah. No. Um, but there, I mean, there's a lot of, it happens. There's yeah. a lot involved uh, other than me frowning and other things. But, um, yeah, the technical term for that is called bleed, you know, sprint bleed. So yeah. something bleeding to the next sprint. We try not to, you know, we try to get really good about, you know, estimating our velocities, how many story points we can do in sprint, because we got to commit to that, right? But stuff happens, right? Sometimes you, you just can't get it done, and it bleeds. And, you know, there's cascade, it depends, you know, it's, it's a cascade, there's a cascade of effects that happen. If it's not a client commit thing, and it's something that, we all feel as a team comfortable letting it bleed, we let it bleed. If there's client commit, we've got expectations, or there's other dependencies in the business that need that thing done, we've got to figure that out. You know, we may push the sprint out a day or two. You know, that's one of the ways we can get at you. Say, okay, let's get this sprint pushed out two days just to get this piece done. Because we won't we want to, we can't deliver this chunk of two week work yet until that thing is done. So let's push it out two weeks. So it all depends. You gotta look at the situation, very situational. And part of but the, it does happen. Yeah, and part of the way that we stay ahead of that and stay engaged and have those conversations and make those decisions is with the daily stand-up. Because if they're not coming in every day and telling us, you know, what's going on, what their blocks are, then, you know, it's we're kind of blindsided at the end, right? But because we meet every day, um, it's something that, yeah, we can engage Bob, we can engage any other people who are communicating with clients and just stay ahead of it that way. So that's another thing that makes it helpful. Because stuff does come up, and remember it's that angry, its fault. Remember <laughs> that angry client? You know, I, I'm the guy that gets on the phone with them. <laughs> to say we didn't deliver that yet. Any other questions? I have a question related to food. Yes, one. Um, it's on like a smaller level. So the daily stand-ups, the retrospectives, there's a lot of meetings in the agile process. You are, how strict are you about like it will not be longer than 15 or 20 minutes? It will not go longer than an hour? Because I'm in a startup company that's sort of starting to develop their own agile scrum approach. Right, right. And that's been one of the main things that we've had to deal with. You know, a meeting that was scheduled 30 minutes, if that goes an hour and a half or two hours, um, it can undermine a lot of trust in the process. <laughs> right, the right. Well, I can speak to one, one item, and I'll talk about the daily, really micro level daily stand-ups. I and mean, we've got 12 people in the room, you know, yeah. 10, 12 people in the room. Our stand-ups 
start at 9.30 and they end at 9.36. <laughs> I mean, it's a six minute meeting. Was it a, did you ever have anything at the company where like, I mean, the team is really enthusiastic, right? That's how it starts to go too long, but if, it, if that trend is, I think for me, because I, I tend to uh, be the one to keep the meeting on track and keep time, I like to keep it within the time, but then it's, it becomes a tough call um, a lot of times if it's very productive, right? So you also don't want to necessarily disband the meeting if you're making a lot of progress or if there's going to be a lot of um, follow-ups, but at the same time, I like to have a solid agenda, this is what we need to get through, and then if there is a follow-up and it doesn't involve everyone in the room, I mean, that's pretty much the test case for me is I take a survey of who's in there, you know, does everyone need to be part of this conversation? Because if not, that's a huge red flag that this is a takeaway item for people to reconvene in a separate meeting. Um, but I think, yeah, once these meetings, it's just meeting, meeting, meeting. You know, there's too many of them and it really disrupts their workflow, and it disrupts the workflow of a lot of other people if you, you know, get off task and everything, so. Right. But, you know, it's really important to make sure that you have a scrum master, right? You need a project management disciplined person to keep control over the process. It just The process doesn't move forward organically. It just doesn't happen that way. You know, you need, it's process, so you need somebody guiding that process and sticking to that process. And the Scrum Master and Agile is the person that does that for us. It's, it's tough though. It's a tough people job. Do, it's people a tough do job. get enthusiastic and you don't want to just be like, okay, you're done, <laughs> you know, <laughs> moving on. But you know, it's, it's, you have to be a little, a little gentle about it. I would, you probably argue that I'm not, but <laughs> that's a discussion for another day. But I think. <laughs> I mean, I'd also point out that having my own issues with meetings, I mean, Sometimes meetings go on because people like to have meetings because it's a way to not do other things, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you guys are talking about like savvy, motivated employees that actually want to go do work, right? But there's yeah, other types of employees that would rather have an hour long meeting <laughs> to cover 15 minutes worth of material because it means I get to sit there and act like I'm doing something, right? Like right. that's my contribution to the project is I show up to meet. Yeah. I have meetings early, too. Yeah, we're so. fortunate. In fact, about, about the meetings, it's, it, the funny part is the engineering team, those six minute meetings, daily meetings, they don't want that because they're six <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so, right? I mean, yeah. And, so, like, when we first come in, I feel like I'm one of the most productive. It's like the most productive time for me. And be able, like, to have to stop to, like, go somewhere and talk about it for, like, six minutes, come back. I actually kind of lose, some, like, some good, valuable thought that I have to, like, rethink through. So, right. it can be very um, disruptive. Right. But, um, you know, there's also a balance to be had because, you know, as we were talking through the whole thing about teamwork, we have a lot of people on our teams that are not developers that need to stay informed because otherwise you may cost that person four or five hours later on in the week, in the month, that, you know, they could have just taken care of by just getting a quick update from an engineer in a meeting. So. There is a trade-off. We try to balance everything out and keep it in mind, but you know, it is. It you know, no one likes to be taken out of the zone. Anyway, yeah, yeah. it's not pleasant. But. Another question. Do you have like multiple teams working within the company? And just how you know you have a traditional structure with the CEO, this VP, does that interfere with this, this kind of stuff? Um, well, first question is on uh, multiple teams. We do. We have one. Our principal team, software development team, is Agile. Our other team is not so much Agile, right? I'm dealing with professional the, services guys. Yeah, the other team is um, professional services, and yeah. so they they have to be a lot more reactive to client requests, right? So, um, you know, unfortunately for them, their priorities change almost daily, depending on what kind of um, you know, if somebody's database is down, they have to drop everything and redirect their efforts. So they're, you know, I mean, if you want to say agile in the sense of <laughs> they have to kind of bob and weave their way through all of their work, you know, definitely um, we challenge that them with that a lot more than our theory development team. Right. Um, and we, we have transitioned more towards two-week sprints just to be able to honor our client commitments. Um, and not have 
the scope of the sprint change too because we also recognize the value of not asking our engineers to switch gears so many times. So Right, right. Yeah, but I mean the client aspect of it makes it really, really difficult. We've, we've tried Agile on, uh, with our IT team. Um, they're very much like the professional service team, very interrupt driven, you know, server down, I got to get to it right now, so all of a sudden we're just going behind, right, so very production uh, uh, motivated. Uh, so that doesn't work really well, that for us it didn't, I know there are some companies that, whose IT teams uh, are agile, our marketing team, uh, our marketing team uses agile, you know, they have, they're very project driven, right, so they've got a lot of projects, a lot of tactics, marketing tactics. So they use Agile, they use the same Agile tools that the engineering team does. Um, relative to the CO, I didn't, I didn't get the nature of the question. Like when you transitioned, you know, you had the waterfall approach. To, right. And was that, was that like job that was a change? How did that work? Did you ask people to come in? Yeah. Um, well, a couple, couple answers to that. One is that, you know, change, making a change like that, it has to come from you, the, the top has to buy in on this, right? Because a lot of there's a lot of things that change in the organization. Um, do job titles change? Um, no, not so much. I mean, it's just it's just working together differently. You know, it's instead of the business analyst, you know, working in their own silo on a feature request, they're now working with this team, and they're not documenting as much. You know, they're just having conversations. With people, so it's a it's a different process of working, but the same people generally are involved in the process <coughs> that work in the waterfall. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe. One yeah. Uh, I'm sure this doesn't happen too often, but what happens if someone finishes something early and has a couple extra days before the sprint is over? I love when that happens. Mm -hmm. by the way. It does happen pretty, pretty it happens. often. It happens. It happens a lot. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. So it's a balancing thing. So what happens is, you know, if we've got one sprint. Um, and that, you know, again, it's, self, it's all self-regulated, so one engineer may be done with his last issue when he sees that all the other issues are taken, what does he do? Um, I've got another sprint built, so there, our rule in our company is you start peeling off the next sprint, right? And we've got to make some, when he does that, he alerts you to say, hey, look, I'm done, what do you got next for me? Let's take a, I'll look at that sprint with him or one of the BAs would look at that sprint and say, okay, these are our priorities order. Do you think you can get this one done in the sprint, right? Because that's the big question. If there's two or three days, the answer is probably yes. If you've only got half a day, the answer is probably no. We don't want to put it in the sprint. We'll start a little bit of work on it, but we don't move it up into the sprint. We'll just have them work on it, keep it in that future sprint, and then they'll finish it off two weeks later. But yeah, it happens kind of regularly. More, the better, actually. <laughs> okay. Any question? One last question. Go ahead. As for the issues that you have within the spring study or do they get better assigned to specialize? For example, if there are coding issues, do they get assigned to specialize software engineers, or is it just the are they just available for? Whoever comes first and what's that is the thing that I do. Sure. So it's a little bit of both, actually. Um, sometimes we actually fight for issues because we find it really interesting. Um, I'll give you an example. Our previous one, we were working on Spring Security in Java and uh, emulating a super user. And I found that really interesting, but I went on vacation for a week, so one of the other engineers picked it up. Um, we have, some of the engineers are very good at certain things because they've worked on a lot. One of our engineers is really good at Jasper and that's our, report, our business reports. So he kind of picks up a lot of that. But sometimes, like for example, I wanted to learn a little bit about it, so I asked him if I could pick it up and do it. It's all about communication, honestly. And just people are like, for example, I've worked a lot with events, and so I know normally I'll probably pick that one up, or some will probably pick that one up. But generally, it's, yeah, it's a little bit mixture of both, and it's all about yeah, one of the things we try to encourage, and you know, these guys are self-regulating it too, it's working really well, is cross-training, right? You don't want this specialization to start to develop. We just, as an example, we just came out with a mobile app uh, about three, four months ago, and that mobile, you know, we have one engineer working on that mobile app, kind of his own team, you know, he had a team of a BA himself, he was the only engineer working on it. I was the product owner, 
and we just moved that that product into our our other uh, sprint team. And what's happening? What what's happening now is that all of the other engineers that we have that are in development are beginning to take pieces of that mobile app and getting familiar with how to develop in mobile. You know, so we've got some cross training because we had you know we definitely had some you know insecurity there with one individual that built that entire app, right? Now we've got to kind of get that immersed into the whole software engineering community that we have. All right. Well, let's uh, thank the speaker. And thank you. Uh, it's one of the, I think, best pre presentation, you know, Gilbert, Carl Jones, <laughs> even, you know, have two people like you, more like a theater, so it's a great, Thanks. Great uh, presentation, and we have a small gift for you. Oh, great. Sorry, we didn't know you guys. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.